And he just knew right away. He goes, true breath? I'm like, yeah, but this time I'm going to tell you like the secret of it, like how to really make it work. And he said, okay. So I lied him down and showed it to him, which I'll show you the technique. So overall, just so he, he knew how to do it. But I said, but this is the biggest difference. Every time you're thinking about what you want to do in golf, you got to do it. He said, okay. And he did it. That day he shot a 78. He went on obviously to make the team. The first day, it's a two day tournament. The first day he was, he shot a 73. You are listening to The Dr. Haley Show, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your health. Each episode, there will be an interview or a message to help you discover better health. We will be featuring health radicals on the show to bring new ideas to the table, as well as doubling down on key fundamentals to support you living your best life. Your host is no other than the founder of Haley Nutrition, Dr. Michael Haley. I'm Dr. Michael Haley, and this is the Dr. Haley Show podcast. In today's episode, we are again meeting with Andrew Block. In a previous episode, we sat down and talked about aloe vera and the history of the aloe number one brand by Rodney Stockton, who is considered to be the aloe vera pioneer. Today, we're meeting with Andrew Block, the physical therapist, author, and inventor of some unconventional healing systems for dealing with pain. Enjoy the show. Andrew Block. How you doing, Mike? <laughs> Thank you for joining me on the Dr. Haley Show podcast, where today we're going to talk about you have an unusual technique for helping people with pain, among other things. You're author of a book. It's got a long title. What was that? It's, it's called The Unseen Science of overcoming stress. Yeah, and there was something that was tagged onto that. Moment by moment. Moment by moment. Yeah, which is really the key to the to really the whole book is the moment by moment aspect. Okay. When did you write that? That's about two years ago in around COVID time period I wrote that. Was it inspired by the stress of COVID being locked up? Yeah, I think it was it gave me the time frame to be able to do it. Mostly my focus is more I'll just say on the physical pain aspect but when you really come to look at it pain there's no such thing as physical and emotional pain there it's always the same no matter what and so i've always focused on the physical side and most of my systems are based on that but around 2014 patients start to to ask me okay w what can i do at home and i didn't really want them to start exercising or doing movements yet so I had to kind of go back and say, okay, how can I influence them and their pain and stress? Because they're really all related, right. utilizing a new system that I created. Yeah. yeah. And I'm going to put it out there, Andrew. I saw it on TV. You were on ABC News, NBC News, on, on a golf channel. And with this technique where they kind of prefaced by saying, to some, this might look like slapping and punching and stretching and pulling and yanking and beating the patients up. Yeah. I didn't think so at all. <laughs> I, you know, I'm a chiropractor. Yeah. So we put people in some pretty tough positions and things pop and crack and make a lot of noise. So for me, it's like, well, that kind of looks almost like what I do. And we get great results. It's not slapping, punching, pulling, yanking. What are you doing? It's a good question. I, I, I through, through my life, I've, I've, had mentors, people that kind of opened up my eyes to a different paradigm, a different philosophy. And one of them was a gentleman named John Imes. And he developed a system called primal reflex release technique. And that really opened up my eyes to how to utilize reflexes to see an immediate change in someone's perception of pain. And that fascinated me. And from that time, I, I kind of went on my own journey because there was aspects of John's system that I felt were lacking and it didn't address the whole body. It just addressed individual areas, whether it be knee or shoulder or back. And so I went on probably about a year or so journey inside myself just to try different stuff. And I guess I'm crazy enough to, to just try things. 
I mean, obviously, they look a little crazy when you do it, for sure. Um, but what I'm really doing is is working on a different nervous system than what chiropractors, PT, massage therapists, and others are utilizing. And so it's a, it's really a different paradigm than the current paradigm that we have in, in medicine. And not saying one is right or wrong. I think they really intermesh well. There's a time and a place for everything. The only aspect of it is there's really no one that's, in my opinion, that's utilizing the the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, or what I call the automatic nervous system, to influence someone's pain or perception of pain to get them to feel better very, very fast. Yeah. And I know there's a lot of similar techniques, not so similar, but for instance, where we're using tapping, for instance, yes, is a lot less aggressive. Yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> but somehow there people are getting results. And I believe tapping is actually more connecting the physical and the emotional together where there's a thought process going in with what might be related to the pain people are experiencing. Chiropractic, very physical, working with the nervous system. So what you're doing is probably using possibly similar pathways as some it's, of the... Yeah, and I, I, lo- I do love talking to other professionals because it's you, you, this is somewhat a little bit of philosophical aspect because you say techniques, but I call it a system. And I differentiate a system in that it's based off a different paradigm. And our, our paradigm in medicine, when I say our, I'll say massage therapists, PTs, chiros, massage therapists, doctors. We have been taught a paradigm when we see a patient, the first thing we want to do is figure out why they're in pain. Then we go off of that assumption of why they're in pain. For PT, it's usually weakness or tightness. For a chiropractor, it's usually a lot about posture. A massage therapist, a bunch of knots or myofascial restriction. And doctors usually like an itis, tendonitis, bursitis, arthritis, something along those lines. We can't leave out uh, nutrition. We can't leave out acupuncturists because we all have our systems and perspectives, but acupuncture kind of uses a communication system of the body as well. Yeah. And I'll put acupuncturists in there because a lot of people don't really understand also how acupuncturists work, but you can throw them in there just, and you can put a nutrition. I don't put in so much of the nutrition side just because it usually takes a little bit longer. And, and all of those things can be true. Someone can be weak, can be tight. Their posture could be terrible. Their nutrition could be bad. And all those things can be true. But the paradigm is to figure out why someone is broken so you can work on getting them well. So at the end, I hope you feel better. So from a PT standpoint, let's just say weakness or tightness. Well, God, that's going to take four to six weeks for them to get stronger or more flexible. So eventually they feel better. And the problem comes is that it it takes too long and the paradigm shift is it with RPT is that the whys are not that important. I have no idea why someone's in pain. And to tell you the truth, they have no idea. And they should, nobody has a clue because there's so many variables. Some you just mentioned, nutrition, stress, other things. So no one really even knows why someone is in pain. And people, two people can go through the exact same experience and have two different. So an MRI could look exactly the same of two different people, but the experiences could be completely different. One person's in the hospital, the other one's playing golf. So we start to realize that. Yeah, from what I've seen too, x-rays or MRIs, it's a point in time. And if we took that same image at a different point in time, chances are we really wouldn't see a difference. Only this time you were in pain and that time you weren't. Correct. And so, and so the, 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 the concept of RPT or the paradigm shift is actually is is not so much to focus on the why is to focus that someone needs to feel better fast so that they can get well so that's where posture comes in to play for a chiropractor that's where strength and flexibility comes in nutrition comes in maybe energy system with acupuncture that's where it comes in but you need to make that immediate shift and the the shift is if you look at the nervous system, we have a somatic or a voluntary nervous system, and then we have an involuntary or what's called an autonomic. I call it automatic. Hmm. 
And when you compare those two systems, one is a voluntary where we're consciously aware, we lift, we tell our body what to do. And the other is the auto automatic, which is our organ system, our heart, our liver, our lungs, and all the organs, which works 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. It's, it's an incredible, I mean, just one, just your heart. It's the most, I mean, it's, it's incredible. We know like so little in that sense of like really how it works. And so the paradigm shift is actually to address the automatic system, to be able to utilize, to assess that system and then make immediate changes to that system. And that's the difference of RPT. That's why I call it a system. <laughs> and it works well with anything else you do. You're old enough to remember like the Ritz, the Ritz commercial. The Ritz cracker. You're gonna have to like, refresh it. It, it, it was the sure thing. It was like a, it was a slogan. Said everything tastes better on a Ritz. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I probably haven't heard that in 20 years, but they more <laughs> they wrote it on my brain. So we're younger, and I think that's almost like with RPT. Like everything is better with RPT. Everything is better when you reset the autonomic nervous system. When you reset the system that's working even though you're not aware of it. I'm hoping that you can reset my system possibly after this. And for those that are paying attention to this, maybe we'll use it as like B-roll as we were talking about it earlier. Maybe I'll be able to dub over some of those images so people know what we're talking about. Yeah, and, and reality is it's like I can explain like a roller coaster. You can look at a roller coaster up and down and the twists and the turns. But there's nothing like getting on a roller coaster. The, it's an experience type of thing. This has always been a little bit of a struggle for me in, in educating other practitioners as well as just other people. Once people feel it and experience it, they're always like, oh, uh, I kind of understand that aspect. So even if you get a little bit like you see different videos, like the newscast and that aspect, it really doesn't do it justice the experience, actually experiencing RPT, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I, I do hear what you're saying. Myself, probably, I probably have a different perspective as a chiropractor because when I saw it, I, I saw what they were describing, but at the same time, there's something appealing to it. Like, it just looks like it makes sense. And I want that. There's yeah. there's kind of an, I want that. Yeah. And I don't know why. <laughs> and one thing I always try to do is get people to tap into that knowledge from above. What What is God telling you? Or if you don't believe in God and you think there's a higher intelligence and you call it the universal intelligence, yeah. it's the universe telling you. When we go to eat something, we know whether or not we should. Yeah. Sometimes we choose to disobey that because we, we want to eat it because how it tastes, but we know we shouldn't. Our, our body knows when we need things. Sometimes we make poor decisions and we know we shouldn't. I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to. Other times we know we should do it and we do it and we get great results. And there's something to that when you see it, it's like, yeah, that's for me. I want that. I would suspect when you were talking about how you had developed it, I would suspect that was you paying attention Ooh. to a knowledge being given to you. <laughs> and that's probably how you developed it. You're quite perceptive. And I, I rarely say this. I definitely I rarely say it within an interview or within the confines of science. But you're 100% right. I'm, I'm clairsentient. I, I feel like I have a way of sometimes touching into things that are not maybe as obvious to others. I think everyone has the capacity of it. And I, I always encourage people. But how I did come up with it is just touching into that. And I guess going back to the craziness, crazy enough to listen to what I was feeling of saying. And when I used to, when I first developed it back in around 2011, uh, I used to tell people, I'm just going to smack you around. You're going to feel better. <laughs> or people would say, well, what does he do? I don't know. He, sm he smacked me and punched me and I felt better. And it took me a while. And with the help of some people close to me to say, you need to do a little bit better job of going back and, and putting more science to it, putting it more, like you have something, it works. There's no question about it, that it's quite incredible. And I say that humbly because I really didn't develop it. I was just Give it yeah, a messenger. Yeah, exactly. So I'm very aware of that. I'm very I'm very appreciative and very humbled by that. But the, they, they encouraged me. And I went to a, a, a psychology course. It's called AEDP, which I, I think is just an incredible 
way of looking at, at the human body and, and interaction. And her name is Diana Fosha. And I was the only PT in, in about 75 to 100 psychologists. And my, my ex-wife, who was instrumental in me going there, said, I really think it'll help you to be able to describe RPT because she's doing a version of that in the psychology world. And she was a thousand percent right. And from that, it really helped me to be able to describe it more of a scientific way, at least from what we know, to really help people to be like, it's not this hocus pocus type stuff, but it actually really is based on the nervous system and how to influence the nervous system. And that helped me to create True Breath, which is the premise of the unseen science of overcoming stress is coming up with a, a way of breathing that influences your nervous system moment by moment. Are you enjoying the show thus far? One of the many health secrets that we have covered on the show is all around aloe vera, specifically drinking raw aloe vera. Our aloe vera has helped our customers effectively heal their gut, increase their intestine health, lower inflammation in the body, eliminate and or decrease acid reflux, have glowing skin and hair, and so much more. Now, as a frequent member of our audience, you will be exposed to exclusive specials and coupon codes for the awesome products manufactured by Haley Nutrition. That's right, for simply being awesome and tuning in, you can get a mini discount to help you optimize and better your health. To see how we can help and support you on your health journey, Tune into the episodes and listen for coupon codes that you can use at www.haleynutrition.com before you make your orders of raw aloe vera. Once again, it's www.haleynutrition.com. Now, back to the show. So you're 100% right. Most of the stuff that I develop, I just try to tune in to what my guides and spirits and God try to align me to. And that, that, it's incredible. It seems that we all have that, but not everybody uses it. And then when people start using it, they get more in tune to it. So they use it more and they use it more and they use it more. And before they know it, they're, they, they are listening to God. They are following God. They are given every direction. It's the person that's driving down the road. And why, why are you telling me to turn left? Why should I go down this road? I never go down that road. No one's there. And, and there's someone at the end of the road that needed your help. Yeah. That stuff happens. Yeah. It, society, it's it's speeding up, obviously, with all the the internet and all the technology. And I, I do believe that we're, we're bombarded. The, and the processing system for us is the nervous system. That is our ability to take in information, our senses. And then what do we do with it once it comes in? And this is is somewhat the basis of RPT and of true breath and what's called reflexive point therapy is to influence the system, to kind of take it back. And it's even hard for me, even the developer of it, to always be in that space because we're just so bombarded with information and taking us away from nature, taking us away from being grounded, taking us away from connecting with other people. And it's it, everything's very, very fast. Like now texting it, like you, you don't have it even these interactions. Why well, sometimes I really love these podcasts much better than a newscast or an interview because it, it it's a lot longer being together. There's something that there's something to, to be said about just being with somebody and and connecting. And I agree with you. I, I I think it's it's becoming lost in our society and taking us away from our for what our possibilities and potential is technology even the wristwatch i don't see no i do not. i don't have a watch yeah but we, people used to know what time it was they didn't have to look at the watch to know what time it was you just knew yeah within yeah. a minute yeah 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 <laughs> when it comes to information we used to figure things out now everyone just goes to a phone or the internet yeah technology has really with the alarm clock you why would anyone need an alarm clock? i don't have an alarm clock i don't use an alarm clock. but I, I i can tell myself what time to wake up and i will wake up at that time yeah but if i used an alarm i would become reliant on it yeah it's a it's a deep philosophical question because there's tremendous advancements with it 
and there's tremendous potential. Like what is nice is I can go and look up everything I want about the nervous system within a few minutes of having a thought about something. So instead of having to go down to the library back then, I had those encyclopedias. And it's so and you get different sort of opinions, which is so nice too. So there's a lot of, like I say, there's a time and a place. I, I, I do believe that the scales are tipped now to us in a direction that is away from that connection. And hopefully at some point in, in, a, in a healthy way, it kind of switches back to where people are actually want to be with people, want to connect, want to create that environment yeah. around nature. Yeah, knowledge is increasing, but connection is decreasing. I had a friend that well, I had a statement. He, he said, knowledge is knowing that a, a tomato is a fruit, but wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. Yeah. And name is Norman. He's a brilliant guy. And I, I think we're becoming a lot more knowledgeable, but I don't know if we're becoming more wise. And... This is a little bit scary because what you start to realize what today, knowledge today, is is usually vastly different within a few years. But give it 10 or 15 years, it's vastly different. And, and these are things that you knew as truth. But a lot of times that's just not it. But wisdom, that usually stands the test of time. And so I really, like, I, I try to put things more when I'm working with people to really focus in on the wisdom as, as opposed to what necessarily knowledge is. And that, that goes into the whole idea of science. Like what is science now? Like, like what are these papers? What are they really telling us? Like we know that I'm not really sure. Like if we have a lot more science, but I don't know if we have a, not, a lot more wisdom. Right. Yeah. yeah. How many other people are, are, practicing RPT? I have a few d disciples, I say. that When I first started, I was working to teach reflexive pattern therapy. And what I really come to realize is that it, it was very, very difficult for a practitioner and to, to take on a new system. And so they try to integrate it in with their own system almost like too early. And I found that it was very difficult to, to teach it. Because it just was. I, I just had my own philosophy of why it was. And I'll, I'll take some of it might have been myself. When you learned, when you develop something new and I had given it, I felt like this responsibility. I wanted to get out there. And I could come across quite brash and a little bit like, oh, I know something and you don't know something. And I, I've kind of humbled myself over that time. So I'll take it that I was probably not the greatest teacher. I was a, I was a clinician. I wasn't really, I didn't, I had to learn to become more of a teacher. Uh, and I think that's a different skill set than being a clinician. And so I'll take some of it is a lot of my own lack of teaching. So I had a f I have a few disciples, but what I created also is reflexive point therapy, which is a much easier way for people to get great results. And this is based off of one of my mentors and gurus, Dr. Richard Tan, called the Balance Method. And his philosophy was that most acupuncturists weren't doing acupuncture like the right way. Mm. That the ancients actually created point selection based off herbs, not based off of points. And that his is only based off of where the pain is located. And I love that aspect. So what he would do is if you had pain in a certain area, he would then push on an acupuncture point in a completely different area and the pain would immediately go down. And that obviously blew my mind. But that was based off a lot of acupuncture and understanding channel theory and that aspect. So I I recreated that. So that's the basis model. that's the basis for reflexive point, point therapy. therapy as yes. opposed to reflexive pattern Correct. therapy. Yeah. And reflexive point therapy I believe is a lot easier for practitioners to learn. It's a simpler format. So I actually stopped teaching reflexive pattern therapy until people really understand reflexive point therapy. Okay. Because if if the a lot of times with reflexive pattern therapy, you, you feel better, but the area still bothers you. So if you come with shoulder, it's like, oh, I feel much better, but my shoulder still bothers me. And that's okay if I now get rid of the shoulder problem quickly. And so 
I kind of reversed it. So now I, I teach reflexive point therapy to eventually then teach people reflexive pattern therapy. If that makes sense. Gotcha. So this might be a little corny, but I hate pain. <laughs> where, where can someone go to find out more? <laughs> well, I, I, my website is, as you cornerly said, <laughs> is IHatePain.org. And I opened up a, a nonprofit. And so I wanted something that just, it's called The Box is the actual name of the, the nonprofit. But I wanted something where people can cre- remember it quickly so that they can at least get access to it. And yeah, it is kind of corny, but it's, 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 it's corny it's, the way I put it. I yeah, think it's a great name because no, who, I, who doesn't hate pain? Yeah. And so when we used to, we had a, we had a site when I had a practice in Maryland and, and we had, it was, I hate knee pain and we focused on knees. And, and so when people would get rid of their pain, like I hate knee pain, it was, it was just a very good tagline. People can relate to it and they can express it. And exactly. You said, I hate pain and then it feels better. So. It, that's that's the way to find me is is I hate pain dot org. <laughs> now, what was T box or the box? Yeah, I call it the box, which is uh, like D apostrophe box. A little bit of my New York roots, if you can hear it in my voice. And conceptually, is it's it's I call it a lunch box clientele. So people, I I want to provide care for people at a very very low cost, where they have accessibility to feel better fast. And it, it, the, the lunchbox crowd is I, people that usually make less than $60,000 a year that they bring their lunch to work because they want to try and save money. So the clientele is that lunchbox clientele. And then what I do is completely outside the box in not only the fee schedule, but the hours and, and the philosophy and paradigms that they're going to receive. And then they donate in the box. And so that was the whole concept of, of the name of the box. Yeah. And it was kind of, kind of like, it was very generic. It's like, it's like, what is the box? Uh, Hopefully it stirs some conversation. Once someone gets something, they say, I went to the box and what is that? And they maybe start talking to him as opposed to the pain box or the relieving box or the healing box or something like that. So the, yeah. after you, the way you explained it, it all makes sense. Yeah. It, the unseen signs of overcoming stress. The flaw, the, the concept is, is a system called true breath and true breath is something that everybody can do. See, if you learn RPT, I teach RPT. I'm just, I'm just like letting that there's a system out there, but reality is it's, it, it's not going to do you very much good because you can't do it on yourself. You can't do a reflex on yourself. This hand knows it's coming. And so when I developed True Breath, and again, it was kind of given to me. So when I say I developed it, I was kind of just, just open enough to accept the information and pass along to others, is, is that when you look at the, the automatic organ system, there's only one organ in that system that we have voluntary control of in an involuntary system. So if I said eat some food, and now go ahead and digest that food. You're like, well, I hope it digests. I mean, I'm not going to take it from my mouth to my, to my anus. It's not going to work that way. It's you're hopefully just going to work. But the one organ that we actually do have voluntary control of is the lungs. And so if you look at it from a spiritual God, that like God gave us access and control of this involuntary system that we just give back. So when we just breathe... We're basically saying to our body and to our system, just, okay, you do what you think I need to do. And, but the problem with it is you're only doing it based off your past. If So if, if you were stressed out, say, about eating and your nutrition, you're just, you're just breathing the same way. You're, just, you're, you're constantly being intertwined in that same paradigm that you have for yourself. So when someone's looking at pain... The one organ that we can utilize is the lungs and how we breathe. And so what I created, and again, I say I, humbly, is what's called the belly-brain reflex. And I think that would actually be much more to show. Sure. And to show you that, that actually you can change your protection just by the way that you breathe. And when you decrease your protection, 
you open up a whole other, it's like eating a new food. It's a whole other process of resetting the nervous system. Because when we look at pain, pain is our body's way of expressing protection. That's how I look at it. And so when, if I put a rattlesnake here, we're both going to run away, right? Probably. Yeah. But we really probably only have to go about maybe a foot or two because the rattlesnake's not going to chase us, right? But we're probably going to go 10 feet to maybe 10 yards, some people a mile, right? Anything more than two feet is overprotection. You didn't need it. Now, if I put a rubber rattlesnake here, but I made it look real, your response would be? Well, if I thought it was real, it might be the same. Exactly the same, right? <laughs> because you can't, if you don't know the difference, you're going to respond exactly the same. In the, in the real world, I'd hold it up. I'd say, Mike, look, it's rubber. You'd laugh. You'd come back in the room. Unfortunately, we don't do that for our nervous system. So we, in my concept, we walk around life thinking everything is a real rattlesnake when most of the time it's just rubber. But we have no, we have no way of holding that up. And I look at true breath as a way of resetting the nervous system so that you can actually say, ooh, that's just rubber. I don't really need to react that way. Or if I did, I don't need that much. I can go maybe three feet. I don't have to go 10 feet. I don't have to go a mile. I might not go two feet, but it's a lot better than going 10 feet, seven feet more or a half a mile away. And so true breath is our ability to utilize our God-given access to our involuntary, magical, automatic system to make moment by moment changes, transformation, however you want to look at it. And that's really the key. So when you look at it like meditation, like people doing mindfulness and doing meditation, which again, I'm, I'm a big proponent of, but it really misses the mark because it just takes too long. So people sit and they do mindfulness for 15 or 20 minutes. Again, not mocking. I think it's beautiful. But two hours later, when they have to go make a decision on something, it, it's usually they're not in that blissful state anymore. It's kind of take they're it, it's taken over. And the way that we work now with so much stress going on, it's usually lost by the time they even got to work with traffic and their boss and deadlines and everything like that, kids. So we need something that we can utilize moment by moment. And that's the, the concept of true breath. And the difference of true breath is utilizing reflexes, the belly brain reflex to actually make immediate shifts or transformation in your autonomic nervous system so that you become less protective, just like holding up a rubber snake. It's reminding me a little bit of people that are stuck in the reptilian brain thinking being brought back to the, I think, cognitive possibly, which is more like the, the balance, the fight or flight, there's a bear in the room yep. versus, no, that's not a real bear. I don't, I'm, I'm okay. I don't have to, I'm not going to starve. I, I, I don't have to catch my food. I'll be okay. Yep. The, the, the whole fight or flight and the survival fear that people get wrapped up in, it sounds like possibly a way of coming back to reality. Well, yeah, because if you look at the autonomic nervous system, those are the two things. Fight or flight, which is more sympathetic, rest and relax, and digest, which is more parasympathetic. And the problem is, is that for most of us, we're stuck in the sympathetic overtone, they call it. And there's different psychological, there's Peter Levine's work and other people that are looking at somatic therapies. So it's very, very interesting in the, when you say that someone is in pain, right? If I'm in a physical pain, I go see a physical therapist, chiropractor, massage, physical medicine. If I'm in emotional pain, I go see a psychologist. In reality, there's there's no difference. They're always the same. They're always, well, I shouldn't say the same. They're, there's always physical pain and emotional pain. So I mean, if you're sad because someone passed away, you also have, the, the physical body is also taking a toll. If I sprain my ankle and it's just a physical aspect, there's a lot of emotional tone of how much pain I'm in, what the response I'm getting from my parents. I want to get back to sports, whatever. There's always, there's always both. Now in the psychology world, 
I think they realize that and they start to actually utilize much more of the body, of the physicalness to help with the emotional side. I think in physical medicine, we're really, really lacking in that aspect of looking at it because we we don't know how to make those shifts quickly because we believe it's either cognitive therapies or other stuff, more talk therapies or that aspect. But RPT, whether it be reflexive point therapy, true breath, or, or RPT, are all the access for a, a physical medicine practitioner to actually work on, let's just say, the emotional pain of life. And so I agree with you that these play a tremendous connection that people that are in pain. And that's where you go on to the, on to the nutrition side, on to the Alice side and on the nutritional side. I mean, those all play a tremendous point because if someone has an increased sympathetic overtone, if, meaning if I put a rattlesnake there, right, the real rattlesnake or even r- rubber, but you think it's real, are you going to be able to digest your aloe or anything else easily? <laughs> no way. No. It's like the body. It's all going to get shut down. It's all get shut down. So when people say like, you can tell someone all day long that nutrition is important and all the wonderful knowledge and wisdom around it, but if they don't have access to their nervous system to put them in a parasympathetic state, to put them in a rest, relax, and digest state, they're just, they don't get the benefit of it. My journey is to, is to incorporate both so people understand that you have access to this this incredible nervous system and utilizing it moment by moment, it opens up a whole new world to you. And I've had just incredible stories of people like they come into you with pain of neck pain, but they come out and tell me, I'm going to let like, I, I went through a divorce that I know I had to go through. Like I finally did it. I finally did something or I, I can't tell, I don't know something about it, but all of a sudden this, and they tell me the story and I'm always like, but it just makes me feel so beautiful and so so great that they came in for one thing, but because they understood and had access to the nervous system, it, it, it not only helped with their neck pain, but really, the I'll just say maybe the underlying, if there was more of an underlying reason to, to help them. Like you were talking about God and spirit saying, make a left turn. You could say that a lot about people in pain, that people come to you in pain because God wants you to recognize something about yourself. He wants you to make a different decision in your life, but you're not able to. And so from a deeper philosophical area, I think true breath gives you that ability to touch your nervous system to kind of just shed a little bit more light, whatever that might be, to really help you to for different possibilities, different opportunities in anyone's life. How does true breath work? Well, true breath w- works. I mean, I mean what, not necessarily how does it work physiologically, but what, what's the, what's, what does a person need to do? So most times in meditation, when you meditate, what's usually the first thing you do? Well, for me, if it was yeah, me, yeah. because I, I was always taught that meditation is like emptying your brain out. So I'm sitting there with my eyes closed saying, well, how am I supposed to get rid of all this? How do I empty it out? And I'm filling it with the thought of how do I get rid of it? <laughs> which is a hundred percent. You did exactly what most people do, which is common. As soon as you say meditate, which is a rest, relax aspect, you close your eyes. So we do the opposite. You keep your eyes open because life happens with your eyes open, not with your eyes closed. Thank you for listening to the Dr. Haley show podcast this month. We're including some content about the founder of the Allo number one brand, Rodney Stockton. And to commemorate him, use the coupon code RODNEY, R-O-D-N-E-Y, for $25 off your purchase of $200 or more at HaleyNutrition.com. That's R-O-D-N-E-Y for $25 off your purchase of $200 or more now through the end of October 2024. Now, back to the show. So I want to change your perception with your eyes open, not closed. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing you do. That's a little bit different. You're going to keep your lips closed, tongue on the roof of your mouth, because when you put tongue on the roof of your mouth, there's a lot of 
chakra aspect that they talk about. There's a lot of ancient wisdom that's wrapped around the tongue on the roof of the mouth and what that does. I believe it has an autonomic uh, aspect that causes you to be more relaxed because if you're running away from that snake, you're not going to be able to get your tongue on the roof of your mouth, right? Right. You're going to be taking as much air as you can through your, through your mouth with the tongue as low as it possibly can. So we're doing the opposite. We're starting to say, okay, now we're going to put ourselves in more of a relaxed state. You're going to breathe in through your nose. And when you breathe in through your nose, there's a whole aspect of is that's how we do as a, as a child. There's a lot of immune response. This is how when we're, when we're babies, this is how we're not developed. We don't have an immune system when we're born. We have a bunch of prior patches, a lymph system, and we have to learn what's good and bad. And so we have all the sinus cavities and all the, 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 the nasal passages is to help us to learn about that. So there's a lot of aspect of just breathing through your nose. And when you breathe through your nose, when your mouth is closed, it kind of goes back to like when people are eating, you shouldn't really be talking when you're eating because you're taking more oxygen in, in through your mouth and you really want to be taking it in through your nose. So you breathe in through your nose. And the big key to it is that all the air goes into your belly, no chest at all. Mm. Because when you're running away from a snake, where are you breathing? Through your chest. Where do most people breathe? If you look at people, I'm a really, I'm an observer of people. It's something that I just, I love to do. I could sit on a park bench and just watch people all day. I'm one of those type of people. You'll notice that most people breathe through their chest. Mm. They naturally will be, and everyone's, they're taking big, big sighs if they have to make decisions. If you ask them a question, they'll take a big sigh before they do it. And they're doing that is because they're setting off their sympathetic nervous system because that's how they make choices. So the big, big key is, is breathing all the air through your belly. Okay. Once you breathe all the air through your belly, you want to hold it. And at this point, your brain starts to come in. And your brain is saying, okay, physiologically, oxygen is now getting converted to CO2. And your brain is now saying, okay, time to breathe out your CO2. And what you're telling now, you're taking back control. Your brain, uh, involuntarily, you'd be breathing out. You just would be breathing. We say, no, no, no. I'm taking control of my life. I'm taking control of the wheel. I choose, not my mind. Now my brain, I'm choosing in this moment what I want to do. And so almost like a spoiled child, you do the opposite. Instead of breathing out, you try to get more air in. And that's what I call the belly brain reflex. And then you hold it until you feel like, okay, now I'm going to release it. And when you do that, you now have taken back over the involuntary nervous system just for a moment. But that moment, is really transformational in that time period. And as you practice more of it, you're standing in line, you're frustrated because uh, you, you're, you gotta wait in line. Traffic, your, your husband or wife, relationships, work. When you start to utilize true breath in all of these aspects, it starts to become natural for you. You start to then breathe through your belly. You start to have a, a more grounded presence. And I think that's, for me, is like something that a lot of patients will say to me, and I, I, I take it as a, a really huge compliment. They'll say, you, you just, you feel so like, patient, you see like so grounded in that aspect. And, I, and I, I really attribute that to the wisdom that I was given about true breath, with this ability of, of, of being inside my belly. Because if you look at a baby when they're breathing, what do they do? Their mouth is closed, they're through their nose, they're just in and out of their belly, which I'm going to show you now, and you can see, and they're in a state of complete bliss because they don't have all the bullshit that we have in going on in our minds and in our heads. But eventually, that five or six-year-old starts to shift. I call it perception versus reality. Well, when we're born, our reality makes our perception. If I take a pencil, this is not a pencil, it's a dart, and I pick my nose with it as a baby, it's anything I want to make it. It's a flying saucer. It's whatever. But then all of a sudden, around four, five, six years old, your mom or dad says, no, no, no. That's not something to throw the walls. It's a pencil, and it's for writing. And not only that, though, it's not for writing anywhere. It's only to write on this little white piece of paper. And then all of a sudden, your perception 
becomes your reality. And this is interesting enough, patterns come in around five or six years old. Mm. So when I've tried to look at younger people treating, usually around three and four and sometimes five, they don't have the pattern. But they start to develop the pattern around that time where I think there's a shift from reality to perception to perception to reality. And I've worked with people as old as 102. And as you get older, you, I think closer to the end, you start to lose the pattern. Hmm. And I don't, I don't have studies and stuff, just my own stuff. I find it quite interesting. And we gave away that power. We gave it away from the baby. And, and this is normal. This is where trauma, this is where everyone has trauma in their life. This is normal. This is God's way of saying, get out there. What are you going to do? Like, how are you going to fulfill your own life? This is free will. Like, get out there. Some people, there's some thought about there is no such thing as free will. I don't believe that. But it's kind of like, get out there. What are you going to do? So part of it is we, we someone have to give that away, the breathing aspect and being in this blissful state all the time. Because we have to, we're playing. We have to get out there. But I, this is an area where now you can differentiate, especially in stressful times where we want to use the sympathetic when we really don't need it. A lot of it is, like I say, rubber snakes. They're not real snakes. Or we're not going to die if we sit in traffic. If, we, if the boss or relate, we're still going to be fine. But we put it like it's a real snake. And so once you do that of eyes open, lips closed, tongue on the roof of your mouth, breathe in through the belly, hold it, wait, try to get more even though nothing is there. So that's the big key. It's not a step. You don't want to take a little bit and then a little bit more. It's maximum. Everything you got, hold it, and then try to get more like you're drowning. Hold it, breathe out through your mouth. You do that two times, and then you do about five, maybe eight times, just breathing through the belly, in through the nose, very just like you were when you were a baby. And the great thing about True Breath, why it makes it moment by moment, is that you could do it anywhere and everywhere. Unlike meditation... You need a nice space, beautiful music. And again, I'm a big fan of it. It's not like, I don't, I don't think it has a time and a place for it. Uh, it's great. But that's the wellness part. People need to feel better fast. So true breath is the it's ability to feel better fast. And then you can work on your wellness, whether it be nutrition, whether it be getting acupuncture, stretching, flexibility, postural work with chiropractors, whatever it might be. And so that to me is something that, you can do anywhere and everywhere. And it tra- it, it's very transformational in your life. If I want to dig in deep in True Breath, get the book, right? Yeah, the book is a great way. It, it, when I say a book, I find it like people write a book about stress and it's like this big. But it's stressful enough just to read it. Like I don't have three hours a day to read this. So it's a very, very tiny, tiny ebook. And the reason I did it like that is I, I just want people to be able to easily utilize true breath and be able to gain access to something very quickly. I didn't go into the science. I didn't go into the involuntary nervous system so much. It can go very, very deep. I try to keep it very, very short, sweet to the point so people can utilize it. Nice. And I I saw it is available on Amazon. It is. Is it also on your website? I hate pain.org. No, the I hate pain.org is really focused towards providing right now i'm just in boynton beach is providing access to i guess palm beach county maybe maybe broward also in dade but is to provide access to people that that don't make a lot of money uh, that are working and struggling in pain got it and and where they can come to a place that's accessible and incredibly affordable the the charge is is minimal based off of income and so that I really focused in on that aspect, not so much in the teaching the RP, the true breath and that aspect. So it's kind of two separate things. Okay. As you were talking about true breath, I'm reminded of one of those singing shows. I may have been American Idol or it was one of those where the singing coach or expert or professional was with their student and actually had them laid down on the ground on their back 
to learn how to breathe with their belly and express their voice from the air coming from their belly instead of their chest because of the tension that would be expressed in the voice when they're chest breathing instead of belly breathing. I forget. It was probably American Idol. I don't know. I didn't see that one, but I have seen many times where people talk about it because you think about the diaphragm and its relation to breathing. And if you're breathing sympathetic, you'll, you'll have a different tone in your voice. It's a little bit more of a sharpness and a little bit, I got to get it out there. And when you're breathing through your belly, it's kind of more of a relaxed. And I am definitely not a singer. I'm the worst singer you can <laughs> ever imagine. But I can imagine if I was a singer, that would be vitally important. But what's what people don't get is I work with a lot of NFL guys, PGA good professionals, like a lot of professional athletes over my time. Obviously, if you can help people with pain, you're you're somewhat well sought out, especially in that world where pain is a really big limiting factor for them. And when I would teach this to professional athletes, it was you would do it in times where you would think like you're on the free throw line. Golf, which is such a mental sport, golf is transformational if you had to control your breath. It, it's 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 unbelievable. Like a quick story I'll say is I had my son. He was a a senior in high school, and he was on the golf team. And he's he's a good golfer, but he never broke eighty. And he had the talent to break eighty. And they had a good team, so he they take the top five guys to go to states. And he was just worried about being on the, on the state team, battling the guy for five and six. And we were out well maybe two weeks before that, and he was throwing his clubs. He was having a very bad day on the on the, you know, on the ride, and and he was quite upset. Like he was just emotional. Like he even cry. It was because it was it was big for me wanting to make the team. It mattered a lot to him. And so the next day we we're going to go play golf and, and he, I said, I really don't want to have a day like that because it's, I want to have fun. He's like, no, nah, it's, it's okay, Papa. I'm not going to go. I'm just going to do it best. I said, do you want my help? Because with kids, you can't just, you can't just tell them what to do. You got to somewhat ask them if they really, and, and he said, yeah, I do. And I said, and he just knew right away. He goes, true breath. And I'm like, yeah, but this time I'm going to tell you like the secret of it, like how to really make it work. He said, okay. So I lied him down and showed it to him, which I'll show you the technique. So overall, just so he, he knew how to do it. But I said, but this is the biggest difference. You got to do it every time you're thinking about a shot. Every time you're thinking about what you want to do in golf, you got to do it. I said, you might do it 300, 400 times today when we play. Because obviously if you're playing golf, you're thinking all the time about it. He said, okay. And he did it. That day he shot a 78. He went on obviously to make the team. The first day, it's a two-day tournament. The first day he was he shot a 73 in tournament play. Uh, he was ninth in the state of Maryland. And the second day he shot a 79. At, he still did true breath. He still played better than he ever was. And he ended up shooting 14th, placing 14th in the state of Maryland in golf. And he knows, and he, and I put him also in the ice tub because I'm a big I'm a big proponent of of cold immersion, and the same philosophy of working on the involuntary nervous system. And both of those things really shifted his ability of being more relaxed because golf is such a golf is such a sport between your ears. Like you can have all the skill, you have skill levels, but every skill level it's incredible when you get to the level of excellence where you're good at your sport. The, the biggest thing to take you to another level is working on the involuntary nervous system. I could see where that sympathetic tension would, you throw out the club head off that much and the ball is off that much. 100%. When you think about golf, it's so crazy. A guy at a professional level could win a tournament. I mean, play unbelievable, win a tournament. The next week, he doesn't even make the cut. How is that possible? And it only can be explained, in my opinion, through the involuntary nervous system because when he gets home, he, his routine is a little different. People treat him a little bit different because he won. He has a different mindset, the involuntary nervous system, about himself. And it might get a little bit lazy at some time, maybe a little bit more pressure like, oh, I got to do that again. And he didn't even know what he did in the first place to do it because he was swinging like he always does. 
But something in that in that time period shifted. He either gained more confidence, he breathed a little bit differently, he felt differently about himself, whether it was relationships or not. And golf to me is the one sport that you take a lot of variables out because no one's going to tackle you. You're not going against somebody else. So at a professional level, golf's a very interesting sport. If billiards, other stuff, yes, darts, of course, they all concentrate on that. Their breathing is very, very important. But golf is one of the major sports that I, I have seen very, very little talking about how to improve your involuntary nervous system to dramatically increase your results. And I have it anecdotally with my son, but just understanding physiology and understanding psychology and understanding the physical medicine aspect, to me, there's no greater and stronger way to, to make that improvement fast. Of course, you want to be stronger and more flexible, your posture. All those things are variables. It's kind of interesting. Well, I'm going to learn and practice true breath and head over to Top Golf. <laughs> now, this is interesting. Is you, skill-wise, always comes into play. But when you do that, you... You, you, if you do it, you might not have as much of like your judgment on yourself. And so I'm always curious. I'm obviously, I love more at the higher levels because you take out a little bit more variables. Like, I don't know how well you play golf. <laughs> so, no, you yeah. so, has a very natural, really, really good swing, but none of us have ever taken the time to really perfect it and forget it. I mean, I could. I could probably break 80 if you take two or three strokes off each hole. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or I get 18 mulligans. So absolutely, which is perfect. My best wood is that one that has an eraser on the end of it. <laughs> it's perfect. And golf is for fun. And when I, I, I talk about it from like, but something that you're say very, very good at, whether it be in your business or educating or what you're doing in life to help other people, like something like, hey, I'm really good at this. Like, this is the part I know I'm good at. I, I then venture to say, hey, when you come up to stuff, do the do true breath and and then see, okay, how that actually pertains. But I wonder how it's going to affect my drumming. If you're if you're a good drummer, I can tell you right now, there's no doubt about musicians for sure. And because music is all about feel, right? Like, what really makes a great drummer is not someone hitting that. It's actually the feel of, it, it's like this, it's this. We call it pocket. Yeah, it's like, it, and, and it's sometimes I'm sure really hard to explain or teach at the higher levels. Like, cause you listen to drummers, I listen cause I don't really have a musical ear. I'm like, oh my God, that's fantastic. That guy's great. And then they play someone else. I'm like, I can't tell the difference, but a musician can say, oh my God, this guy is so much better. And I will say, Absolutely, absolutely. The involuntary nervous system plays a tremendous part of that uh, in how in how you play. So, right. yeah, for sure. I've got some studying to do, some learning. <laughs> yeah, just experience. That's the good part about it. It's easy to do. You could do it anywhere. You don't need any equipment. It, it's just simple. It's, it's like, it, it's so crazy. Sometimes I'm just, I feel so blessed that like I was able to touch in and, and, and share it because mindfulness has become such a huge thing and I'm I'm a nice proponent of it but the problem with mindfulness is it's just like exercise like everyone knows what to do but doing it is a different a different animal and so mindfulness is is it it it, it takes it takes a lot longer to to work on so I would say do the opposite work on your breath and then start the journey of meditation of mindfulness of other stuff like that but if you really want to see like transformation work on the involuntary nervous system is the fastest way i hope you enjoyed that episode today on the dr haley show make sure to hit subscribe on whichever platform you are listening to this if this episode made you think of someone go ahead take a screenshot and share this exact episode with them you can catch the show notes for this episode on www.drhaley.com. If you want to geek out with Dr. Michael Haley on other radical health topics, be sure to check out his YouTube channel where he posts exclusive video content. All the details are at www.drhaley.com and we can't wait to hang out with you on the next episode.